Welcome to Old Path, and we're glad that you're here. We uh, conclude the book of Psalms today. And uh, if you're kind of newer to the program or haven't been here the whole way, um, I looked it up. I had to go find out when did we start the book of, uh, of Psalms. And I do know that in that interval of time, there were a few weeks when I would have been traveling. And I think I put a study up from a conference or something that I had done. There's maybe two or three of those. I don't think there's that many. So I went back and looked. And the first study that we did in this was uh, May of last year, May 8th of 2023. So there's been a little bit more than 70 uh, different studies just in the book of Psalms, which surprised me. Wasn't expecting that. It means we basically have been able to uh, to cover about two Psalms on average, a little bit more than two Psalms per uh, per week. And uh, we'll, we'll actually get through three today. Um, they have a lot of commonality to them, and, and it's the ending of the book. But, um, you know, just a kind of full disclosure, um, I, I was saying this to a friend recently that uh, when it came to the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms is a challenging book for uh, for a pastor to teach, um, mainly because there's a lot of language things that you want to be able to understand. And you're not necessarily doing doctrinal things that you're used to covering, like in the New Testament, per se. But when you get to the book of uh, of Psalms, it's all going to be, for the most part, application. What does this mean to us? And what is God revealing about himself through the person that is writing these things? Because remember, there's a lot of times, uh, unlike, say, the prophets or something like that, where God is speaking directly through the prophet or through the person, these are mostly from the perspective of the person who is writing and they're ascribing to God or telling to us their observations of things and it's it's exhortative in a lot of places like we should really do this and it's we're going to have those uh, for the three that we have here it's the idea of let's praise him let's give glory to his name he is to be exalted and all of those things which we should all agree with um, but what makes these really kind of cool, and this is interesting because it's something that I'm, I'm more appreciative of this time through than I have in the other times we've been through Psalms. And that is that we could, it's almost like we could just pull up a seat next to the person that's writing and cheer them on and say, amen, I couldn't agree with you more. But um, at the same time, as you, I, I think I've, I've emphasized it quite often here as we've gone through this, there are many times that there are observations that, that the writers in the Psalms will make about God and who he is and what he does and, and you know how he does the things that he does. And we say, Looking at those same ideas through the New Testament prism, it really does become a much different book when we look at it through the eyes of the New Testament. Because think about this, God has revealed to us in these times his son, and we grow in our knowledge of God because of his son who has revealed him in ways that the Old Testament simply could not have done. We have the assistance of the Holy Spirit who resides in, uh, indwells the believer. Um, so we have him present in our lives and he's the one who leads us and guides us and gives us understanding. And again, we have benefits that the Old Testament saints could have only dreamed of. And we, a lot of times just kind of take it for granted. So it is why this time through the, the Psalms, my, my encouragement to all who are, are um, following along in these is to look at them and say, here's Old Testament passages that we could look at verbatim and just say, amen, and we can repeat them because it's not the Lord speaking directly to a group of people about a very narrowly focused point in time or an event. In this case, we're just one of the people, let's just say, in the congregation singing the same praises Based upon the way that we know God, it's even more, more concrete. And we have some of those examples. In fact, I think you'd find that in any of the in any of the Psalms, as you read through them, and you would say, if I could put myself in the shoes of the person who's writing, based on what they would know about God, because it's only under the law that they know him. It's only based upon the books of Moses as far as their sacrifices and uh, all of their their corporate worship and their their national, you know, their national identity, all those things things. All Old Testament. When we're looking at it, we're able to look at the things that are spoken of here and say, what has God revealed to mankind since the writing of those things? If you were with us for last week's uh, study, the close out of that book or that, that, uh, that last Psalm 147, 
is where it talks about how God has spoken directly to it. He, he breaks them up into two pieces to Jacob and Israel, but he means the same thing. It's that God has given his precept, statutes, judgments, his written word, his his you know, the books of Moses, if you will, the law, he's given those things directly to Israel and he's not given them to any other nation. They are unique in all of human history that God would speak directly to a nation of people genetically and where they live. Now, in the, the writings of the New Testament, that has changed dramatically because now everything has been known to the whosoevers and God puts his invitation out to all who will hear him. And it doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter where they live in the world. It doesn't matter what their background is. None of those things matter. There is no distinction at that point. And so it's not that God changed his mind. It's just that God has communicated and always has communicated. And yet we see that he had spoken to the fathers in times past, as Hebrews 1.1 tells us, but he has now spoken to us through his son, and that expands it to all of mankind. So just so amazing how we are able to read a text that we, that we identify with, we agree with it so much, but... Again, from the New Testament perspective, we have a fuller revelation that God has given because time has passed and everything that was shadowed that he would be doing future time, and especially when it culminates in the person of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin and all of those types of things, everything David ever had asked God to do or the other writers when they're just asking the Lord for these things, we really have so much of what they were hoping for is something that is to us second nature. We expect those things because they're already in place and they're immovable. They cannot be rescinded. So it's just an amazing, amazing book when you read it from that perspective. And so we're going to read these, uh, these last three, 48, 49, and 50 and uh, conclude the book. Next week, we start into the book of Proverbs. Probably be able to move through that one a little bit quicker. Uh, if you've not been in the book of Proverbs before, you're going to notice it's... Um, it, it moves very quickly because it doesn't, it doesn't park over some particular topic with any kind of detail. It really just kind of a lot of times that, that the fool will do this, but the wise will do that. Sometimes it's just point counterpoint and it's just one thought after another. Sometimes they seem connected. Other times they seem somewhat disconnected. They're just thoughts. So we're able to move through those. And there is, in some cases, a bit of redundancy. Because let's remember, as he, as he wrote these things, they're kind of a collection, very much like Psalms would be as well. That's why you'll find that sometimes they're repetitious, uh, almost verbatim repetitious in various places. So we will, you know, we'll be careful to work our way through it accurately, but we don't have to, um, uh, since there's going to be a lot of repetition, we'll probably move through it a little bit quicker than, uh, than other books that we've, uh, that we've had to do like, you know, uh, like Psalms. So we'll see. I mean, I can't make any guarantees. I'm just saying that's a possibility. So, uh, with that being said, let's, uh, let's turn to the book of Psalms where Psalm 148, let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at our text. Father, we thank you so much once again for your word. We are grateful for what it has to say to us and what we might be able to learn, how it would cause us to grow in you. So we give to you all thanks. We pray, God, that you would lead us and that you would guide us by the Holy Spirit and uh, give us understanding that we might make proper application to your word in our lives, that we would be changed. We give you thanks. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. One thing I, I failed to uh, mention, um, if there's anything that you hear me say in this particular study and you think that it would be useful, uh, we're going to start putting together reels or shorts or whatever they call them, things you can put on TikTok and whatnot. Uh, we want to start driving more attention to the YouTube channel and, uh, of course, to the website in particular. Um, want to start putting up a, a whole lot more content. I'm not looking to monetize this. Um, I don't want to do this for, you know, for any kind of, uh, you know, gain that way. That's not my intention for ministry. So uh, if people want to contribute, they can, but I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to make this commercial. It's not my objective. Uh, the only thing that really matters to me is that God's word is taught accurately, and I take that part very seriously. Uh, some people that disagree with me on various things might not believe that, but I do mean it. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we're able to present 
the entirety of God's Word. From Genesis 1-1 to the last verse of Revelation, we want to get to it all. So uh, it's just very, very important that we take the whole of God's Word and make it known to the masses. And so that means Old Testament, New Testament, side by side. It's why we do the two studies a week. And it's, it's very, very important to me that anything that we can do to get um, uh, you know, views and uh, get people used to studying through the Word of God. I don't want to try to just be an entertainment kind of thing. I don't want to just do topical stuff that tickles the ears. We want to go through the whole of God's Word because He took the time to write it. I want to make sure that we take the time to read it and to learn it and to understand it, not just read it, but to know it. So best we can, followed by or uh, because the, the Holy Spirit leads us in that direction. That's what we desire to do. So like the channel, hopefully. Uh, like the videos if you do. I don't ask you to do something that you don't agree with. So if you don't like the video, don't hit the thumbs up. But if you do, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, um, and then you'll know when content's going up. So Psalm 148, we have uh, in this, we have 14 verses. We'll just take it, uh, the first part of it. This is really just kind of praise. And they're, they're all going to have this in common. This is a call to the believer to recognize God for who he is and to offer to him praise, thanksgiving, worship, all of those words would, would basically fit here. That's the, the thought of it. It's the, it's the verbal mind, you know, engaged recognition of who God is and that all of creation should be involved in this because God is good and he does the things that he does with intent. He knows why he's doing them and he's given us his word to let us know those things and why they're important. So with that in mind, we read this in the uh, in the first part. So we'll read verse four, uh, verses one to four. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all of his hosts. The first parts, the heavens and the heights. What we're trying to get to here is is the totality of, of human being and the, the totality of, of all things that can offer up to him praise. So it's not trying to drill down on the particulars of what's the difference between this, that, and the other thing. We're not focusing in so much on that because that's not really the intent of the writer from everything that we see here. He's writing it in the most grand of ways, everything that could possibly recognize him, praise him for who he is. So when you see the difference between angels and hosts, angels are um, like in the book of Revelation that we're going through. There are, there are people who are assembled or there are figures that are assembled in the throne room of God. There are the living creatures, there are the, then they fly and they do their things. And then there are ones that are referred to as angels, some standing before him, angels in other places. So angels as opposed to hosts would be anything else that is in that that we don't necessarily uh, identify as angels. So you can have something that is a heavenly host that would not be identified as an angel. So uh, in the Old Testament sense, at minimum, we have things like cherubim, seraphim. They might, you could say that they're types of angels, but they're not identified as angels. There's living creatures that fly around. There's all kinds of different entities, if you will, that we look at. And that's what's being referred to here. Anything that's not in the category of angels, the hosts. So praise him, sun and moon, all you stars of light. Um, and uh, praise him, you heavens of heavens and waters under the heavens. That's just the, the way of all of creation. Let all of creation praise him. So let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. So it goes beyond just saying about him in the most general of terms, but he says, praise his name. And it's easy to, to read right past that and not really stop to think about what that means. But a person, everything that you could know about them is known by their name. That's how we identify who they are. So his name is, there's a song that we used to sing way back in the day that his name is wonderful. His name is, there's a whole bunch of different things where you could say that these are things that we would associate with his name. So we can say God or we can say his name if you Yahweh, Jehovah, however you would say it. If we try to, to put something to his name, that just misses the identification because a proper name just is an identification of the person that you might see in front of you. But if you're going to praise his name of what, what he represents, then it really kind of expands. Because when I say, when I say to you, what do you think of when you think God? He's my creator. He's my savior. He's the lover of my soul. 
He's my provider. He's my protector. He's my shield. Go on and on and on. And you could probably write a list this long. But those are things that are associated with his name because that's God my Father. Or that's, that's God the Lord Jesus or whatever that may be. Whoever we're speaking about, there are those things that are attributes of who they are and the things that they do and our interaction with, with God and what he has revealed to us. So Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit to us? He's the one who dwells in, in my, my heart and he's the one who tells me the things that, that are acceptable, what are not acceptable. He's the one who opens my eyes and expands my understanding to God's word. It's not just literature, it's just not words on a page, it's life. And he's the one who opens my eyes to those things. He's the one who leads me and guides me in truth like Jesus promised. So when, when we think about the name and how he's identified, um, that's one thing. It's, it's the identification or, the, or who he is, but what does he do? And that's also part of his name. So think of it in, in even greater terms than, than what we might think by just his name. So let them praise his name or everything that is about him for, and here's why, because he commanded and they were created. Now, uh, the, those are the created beings that should be praising him. It's because of him that they have their existence. And then in verse six, he also established them forever and ever, and he made a decree which shall not pass away. And of course, a, a decree is simply, it's just, it's the enacting. God prescribed it. This is what I want. This is what will take place. And he spoke it into existence. So here's what the Bible talks about with that, that whenever he wanted something done, it says he spoke it into existence. Now the cults, I, I don't even know if you would call them cults, but the, 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 the heretical teachings within the church, that there are some that uh, believe that, that um, we have the same uh, creative ability that God used because they would tell you he used his forth, force of faith to speak things into existence. He had to use faith to speak things into existence, which is just bizarre and it, almost embarrassing that people believe this. But of course, there's a real reason behind it because they want, to, they want us to believe that if we have the same creative ability and we can speak things into existence, you have to bring God down to your level in order to act like him because you can't come up to where he is, but you could try to bring him down to you and meet him somewhere in the middle and say that you've got the same creative ability that he does. Again, it's garbage. And of course, everybody who's tried it and failed is always told by the people who are selling that nonsense that uh, it's their fault. They just didn't have enough faith. And implied in that, the only reason that God succeeded is because he had enough faith in his words to create. Yeah, nuts. But... It says he also established them forever in the establishing again. He positions things and he holds it in place. It goes right along with what we read in, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, that he uh, upholds all things. Um, and then uh, we see that same thing that, um, that you find in, in uh, the first few verses of the book of Hebrews. Same thing. Everything in, in Hebrews in particular and uh, Colossians, it's both uh, ascribed to the person of Jesus that the whole of creation is dependent upon his carrying it so that it doesn't just blow apart at the speed of light. It's just everything about creation is dependent upon him, the one who created it. And again, it's something that people sometimes don't understand. Yes, God is involved in, in the creation, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, all present. But we understand that the, the actual creative work itself was done at the hands of Jesus. We get that from John 1.1. 1, 1. All things were created by him and through him, and without him, nothing was created that was created. Verse 3 of John 1. So <clears throat> it's not that he was acting independent of God. It was just that, it, that the agreed upon, if you will, is that Jesus would be the person, the agent by which that would take place. So again, Colossians agrees with that. Um, and, and again, uh, John 1, 1 through 3 is all agreed upon. Jesus was there present with the Father, and through Jesus, all things were created. That's what we're told. You know, people want to argue that. They can argue it all that they want to, but it's pretty clear from the text. So, he established it forever and ever, so in the eternal sense, and he made a decree which will not pass away. So, the here's an interesting thing, because again, New Testament, we understand the things that God has decreed and the, the actual existence of all of creation does have an end point. 
but that's a New Testament thing that we understand much, much better. So we know that everything will be dissolved with a fervent heat, like we hear from uh, 2 Peter 3. We also know that, that uh, God concludes everything in the book of Revelation. If you start reading chapters 19 on to the end of it, it'll take us a while to get there. We're going through it on Thursdays. But if you read the entirety of everything from chapters 19 to 22, you're going to find that there are some major changes that take place and we see a new heaven and a new earth. So the old thing's gone. Something is completely remade. And so the writer of, of Psalms here didn't have the same kind of details that we have because it gives the impression as though, if you just read it at, at face value, the, the creation itself is something that will be there forever. Well, yes and no, what God created as far as mankind and uh, the relationship that we have with him, that part of that will go all the way through. But what we see as far as the visible creation, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that will be revealed to us. So verse seven, praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all of the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Um, Again, remember what we're reading here is a call for all of creation to resound back the the sound, whatever it can utter in the way of, of ascribing to him worship. So again, it is now applying to inanimate things, uh, the ability to do things that those that are, are animate, the things that are alive to do so. And so it's not that he's trying to get some new agey kind of a thing that God is in all things. We know that is panentheism. It's the new age kind of a principle that the earth is alive and that it's sentient and all the rest of that stuff. That is not what's being taught here. This is just the way of saying, let the whole of creation with its ability, whatever it may be, let it, let it speak of who he is. So again, when I look at the sun, do I have to think that the sun is alive and, and that somehow there's a connection that I can make with it? Or can I I say, look at how it burns and does what it does. And it's been doing so for thousands of years and it gives life to all of creation. That is its testimony. The sun's testimony is that God created it and without it, we wouldn't be able to exist. It speaks of his creative genius, that it's just far enough away from the earth that it doesn't burn us up and it's close enough that it doesn't let us freeze. So that's the creative genius and let it proclaim him. So the moon, every bit of creation, it sings about who he is based on what it presents to us. That's what's being spoken of here. It's not alive in the sense that it's uh, that it's alive in the sentient being type of thing. That's again, that's the goofiness of the new age uh, movement. So um, notice what it says, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, verse eight, fulfilling his word. It means that it's all done subject to what he had spoken into existence. He spoke those things into existence. And so they were just, they were just doing what he said. So they came into being at his word. So mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowls, kings of the earth and the peoples, princes and the judges of the earth. So kings, princes and judges. Again, it's just the idea of the people that would be above just the normal part of humanity, the people who are in those places of rulership. And again, through the ages there were and still among us today. There are kingdoms and the kingdoms have their princes and they have the people who do the judicial things and they they operate between the people. Um, we live in a, a, a representative republic. It's kind of hard to say that nowadays because it just seems like we have a ruling class here that, that treats us like plebes. But uh, we still have that that same understanding of, of, a, of a free society. But this is not really only looking to. Uh, monarchies and the, the structure of government that there might be there. What this means is even up to the highest of the high levels of people, let them also in turn add their voices to the chorus. Kings of the earth and the peoples and all the peoples. That's why you notice that they're, they're added there. Princes and judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Uh, so verses 11 and 12 are supposed to just get us to the point of recognizing he's saying all of creation. So the created things and even the humans from the from the greatest to the to the least, they're all to join in. Verse 13, let them praise the name of the Lord 
uh, for his name alone is to be exalted. So his name above all others, the idea of being alone. There are things that are said about him that should never be said about anyone else. We don't worship anyone else. We don't put any person or anything in his place. That would be idolatry. So the recognition that he stands above all because he is unique and there is none like him. That should be our recognition of who he is. That should be our relationship with him. So um, let them praise the name of the Lord that uh, for his name is alone to be exalted. And that exalted is actually a verb form. It means lifted up. So uh, when we think exalted, we, we can think of it in the noun form. But this is a call for us in our praise that we would make his name high. We would put it up there. It's, a, it's an action that's supposed to take place rather than a thought, a principle, a noun. It's an action. Exalt his name. Lift it up. Uh, four, and here's why. Because his name alone is exalted. It's, it's, it's above. And it says, his glory is above the earth and the heaven. And so the glory is everything that we know about him. It's his majesty. It's his greatness. It's his the awesome God. It's above anything else. There's nothing that rivals him. There's nothing that's in his category. He stands above and alone by himself. Now, again, how cool is this? Because as we read this in 2024, the person writing this more than likely um, towards the, the uh, latter reign of the kings um, is actually, um, actually, it's not even that. It's after the, probably after the time of the kings. We're thinking probably more Nehemiah, Ezra, more than likely after the Babylonian captivity. These last ones seem to give that impression. The next one for sure does. Um, but if that's the case, just think the way that they recognize God versus how we would recognize him. So we would be able to say, when we consider who God the Father is, is he worthy of praise and, and uh, of, of uh, honor and glory and, and, uh, and worship? Absolutely. How about the Son? Yep. How about the Spirit? You bet. Absolutely. All the above. Because without them, we can't function as a believer. Without Jesus, I have no hope of salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, I have no one to indwell me and, and to make his word known. I have no regeneration caused by the Spirit. And without the Father, I don't have the one who would send his son to die for my sins because that was his desire. So, you know, the, our understanding of God and his understanding, the writer of the, of the Psalms here, it's not that they're incorrect. It's that they're working on, on limited inf information as opposed to what we have. They're not wrong. They're just not in the same place of, of knowledge that we are, which really does, if you think about it, really puts us in a place where we should be paying very, very close attention to our relationship with the Lord and what that means. So very, very important, very careful that we should be uh, recognizing that. So. Verse 13, let them praise the name of the Lord. His name alone is to be exalted or is exalted and the glory. His glory is above the heaven. He has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all of his saints, of the children of Israel. And so the exalting of the horn, the horn is the power. It's seen as the, the power of, um, of a nation. So horns are represented as, again, power. Think about the, the prophecies that you see in Daniel in particular and the horns that are on the animals that he sees there, especially when you think of, of people like the Greeks and Alexander and uh, the little horn that would be coming up, the Antichrist. These are all that that horn represents their power in nature. We recognize that again as well. So a young a young male of like a deer or an elk or anything that would grow horns, the younger that they are, the smaller the horns are. They haven't grown into their place of maturity, but the the greatest and the strongest and the most the, the most alive, the most vibrant, uh, the most powerful are the ones that are a little bit older that have much more in the way of, of the horn. So it, that's again, you recognize it just by looking at it. That shows power, that shows authority, it shows greatness, right? Well, here it says the horn, that thing that represents the power of Israel, because of what God does with them, he's the one that exalts it or he's the one who lifts it up. He's the one that makes it um, he, he makes them prominent. So he's exalted the power of the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints of the children of Israel. And this is seen as probably a reciprocal thing that as the people see that God raises them up and gives them power and gives them ability, they in turn praise for that which God has done. So that's one way that, that can be looked at it. Or it's just that they live 
under the benefit of God raising them up. You could make the case for both of those things. So it says um, a people near to him, and then it ends with praise the Lord just as it begun. Uh, Psalm 149 says this, praise the Lord again, starts the exact same way and ends the same way, just like Psalm 148. It says, sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the assembly of the saints. Now, a new song means exactly that. So a new song to the children of Israel. What new song would be would be sung based upon when the Psalms first started to be collected? Um, when they're victorious, absolutely a new song could be sung. When they would have come into the um, uh, to the, the land of Israel uh, the first time with the tribes in Joshua, they could have sung a new song because they're in a land that they had never they had never known before, but it was their inheritance. They could they could sing a song about coming into the land of their inheritance. So we find that again in Revelation we sign, we find it quite often of a new song that is sung because there's something that has been revealed and something that has taken place that doesn't have a precedent. And so they're able to sing about this. Now, it gives the impression, this one in particular, and I'll show you here in just a moment, uh, there's even more internal evidence, I believe, of it. But the writer here of this particular psalm, by saying a new song, if it means that um, if, if it's coming back from the Babylonian captivity, that's a new thing. Though it had been prophesied, prophesied that they would be taken away, prophesied that they would be brought back, how long it would take from them being displaced to the beginning of their being brought back. All of that is there. If you're Ezra, if you're Nehemiah, and you've come back and God has given you the dictates to rebuild the walls and the temple has already been rebuilt and then you start the, the corporate worship the way that it's supposed to be, that's a new song. Because the, the old was that we've been displaced and our walls are broken down. We don't have a place of corporate worship. We're displaced. We're in a place of danger because we have no fortification. Once all that's taken care of, can you sing a new song? Yeah. Lord, you've brought us back to our land. You've given us favor over our enemies. You've given us a place of fortification. We now have a temple that's here again. You've, you've seen to our well-being. That would be a new song that they could sing. That's more than likely what's in mind here, and it fits the context really well. So verse 2, let Israel rejoice in their maker, which of course is speaking of God, and let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. That king is capitalized there. And again, especially if this is, as I believe it is, at, at the time that they've returned from their captivity, they don't have a king earthly, but they recognize God as their king, especially since he's brought them back. The new song would reflect that. Sadly, when you go back and read this, the history of this, from the time that think with, again, Nehemiah into Ezra, and everything is back the way that it's supposed to be, then go read the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and look at the condition of the priesthood in just a matter of several decades. And you'll see how desperately messed up the nation had already become because they had just reverted back to all of their same old things. They they became religious about things and no longer was it this vital day-to-day -day relationship with God. It became the same mundane, repetitious, religious stuff that, again, it plagues much of the church even in our day. Um, because again, you can get so stuck in ritual and tradition that you lose sight of what you're there for. So anyway, they did it. You can see it. It's uh, interesting that they could go from a place like this to the deadness that was taking place in them after. So it says in verse three, let them praise his name with the dance. And so again, the praising of the name, we looked at that in the last verse. And then it's or the last, um, the last Psalm, I should say. Verse 3, let them praise him with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and the harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people, and uh, he will beautify the humble with, um, with salvation. Now, this is, this is just really beautiful. First of all, it says, let their, their worship of him be with the, the musical accompaniment. That's what's being spoken of here. But the idea that he adorns, look at how he puts it here, or that he beautifies, he glorifies the humble uh, with salvation. The, the beautifying of the humble, um, it means that he just lavishes upon them glory. And it's not like glory in elevating them beyond what they're supposed to be. It's rather that he gives them a position that is not something that they, they could expect any other way. He exalts them. He brings them up 
different than what they would be without him. That's what's being spoken of here. And if we think about it in its fullness, what does that actually mean? That the idea of salvation, if we think about it in a New Testament sense, what would this sound like if, if we were writing it, being thankful? The idea that, that our salvation in the person of Jesus is an adornment. Uh, and we almost think of it in the sense that we're always hearing about white robes, and it's something that we uh, that we encase ourselves in. We we hold ourselves in it, and we're so thankful for what God has provided for us. Salvation being the outcome of that, but God gives it to us as something again the robe, something that we put on that we wouldn't be able to do of our own. It's given to us, and then we adorn ourselves with it. This is the, the same thing that's the same thought that's here. So it says in verse 5, So let the saints be joyful in glory. And I want to point this out again. It, it bears repeating whenever we come across it. Notice what we're looking at here. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Now, I come from a Catholic background, and there are people who believe that in the Catholic Church, they're the ones who teach this, that the saints are minted, if you will, or they're made by the church, and they have to fit some little bit of a criteria. When the saints that are being mentioned here, they are not speaking forward in time to the Catholic Church. And if you were to take a look at the uh, at, at um, if you if you're reading the Old Testament in Greek, um, which there wasn't a, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but it was translated in Greek uh, through the Septuagint. When you look up saints, you'll find that that kind of works nicely from Greek in the Old or the New Testament. It's just looking at those people who are the believers in, in God. Um, so you'll find people referred to as saints in the Old Testament and in the New. And it really simply is just kind of a generic term for those people who have identified with him and they are his people. They are therefore saints. So don't let people try to tell you that um, that saints are only created by some formality of of a church saints are it's god who refers to them as this and again in the old testament there was no recognition of some church down the road there wasn't a church to be had when the psalms were written there wasn't even a church possible until jesus so when god is referring to his people because sometimes he will refer to them as saints other times they refer to one another as saints and here's one of those cases here in the old testament let the saints be joyful in glory and let them sing aloud on their beds and so this letting them sing aloud on their beds. This is again why I believe that you find this is a, a alluding to a time after coming back from their captivity because there was no rejoicing in captivity and that time when you're just on your bed. You know this probably as well as uh, you know all humans. Your, your thoughts and the things that go through your mind when you're going to sleep and it's kind of the end of the day and you're just captive to your thoughts, if there's a thing that's really grievous that's happening in your life, you're probably thinking about that a lot more at night because all the other, the, the other things that kind of vie for your time are gone and you're kind of left just focusing on those things. Imagine being in captivity and separated from your home, longing to be there, but you can't. And so there would be that time, what would you be doing? You'd be remorseful, you'd be saddened by it, maybe even the sense of tears. Here he is saying, let the saints be joyful in glory and let them sing aloud on their beds. So instead of weeping and, and with the sense of regret and sadness, you're then singing forth, even when it's, it's time to go to bed, there's still a song in your, in your heart, in your mind. And I think that that's just really cool. Again, a New Testament sense. I hope that we all get a chance to do this. That even, you know, if, if we if we save our prayer time before we go to bed, that's all well and good whenever you decide to do it. But there should be at that time, you know, at the end of the day when there is, if nothing else, just a simple recognition of your gratitude to God for the fact that, that he's done the things that he has done, the recognition. No matter what we do or do not have in a physical sense, the idea that we can just in a moment say, Lord, I come to you. That by itself is, is beyond description. It's beyond the imagination to fully grasp the beauty and the, the awesome wonder of that. And it should be something that puts the song in your heart as you, as you end your day. So he says um, in verse 6, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Now we think, if we just read that without really kind of thinking what's going, what's going on here, you might think, well, that's kind of dark. You know, the idea that we'd be praising him on the one hand, on the other, we've got a sword, like we're going to go make war. And this is one of the reasons why we kind of think that um, that this is 
probably alluding to the idea of them being back in the land because we know from Nehemiah as they're building the walls, they were careful about their enemies and they were always on watch. And it said that with one hand they held a sword and with the other they, ha they held a trowel. Uh, the idea of something to build, you're building with one hand while you're on guard with the other. And so it's that same kind of imagery and it would fit nicely if that's when this was written because they recognize that they're doing two things. God has restored them to the land, but they're having to refortify that which was broken down because of their disobedience. And because of that, they're also in a place of vulnerability. So they are that at that point going to have to also defend themselves. But look at what the writer of the psalm uh, has to say after that. Now, after they, this is after we fortified ourselves, then here's how they, this writer sees that they're supposed to do. To execute vengeance on the nations. That's what he sees his point to do. These people who have done this harm to us, we will then in turn do to them and punishment of the peoples. To bind their kings with chains. That was done to Zedekiah by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. When, uh, when they came in and finally conquered Jerusalem, their little vassal king, Zedekiah, was taken away in fetters, in chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron, and uh, then to execute on them the written judgment what God said would be done to those who would do damage to them. Now, let's remember, if we're going to look at this in the historical sense, kind of an interesting thing that you think about, because there were those times when God would exact a very heavy cost on the nations, even when he used them to be the ones to chastise his people. Think Egypt is probably the best of the examples. So, Again, there was a time when Egypt had the ability to do the things that they did, and they put them into a place of slavery. God allowed it to be the case, but when they left, they basically took plunder with them. And so they took fabulous riches, and it was it was able to be brought with them all the way into, uh, into the land when they came into it those 40 years after the Exodus. But again, the idea that God would do... Uh, things to the nations after that time. Remember, again, he used Nebuchadnezzar to take his people, but what ended up happening to Babylon at the hands of the Persians and the Persians by the Greeks and the, the Greeks by, or by the Romans, same kind of things. They, the way that they interacted, sometimes God would use these foreign countries, but they were never able to withstand God for the way that they treated his people. Edom, Moab, Ammon, all of those people, as they were coming up after that time of, of Egypt, once again, they were, they were people who hassled and harassed, but God exacted a massive price on those people. So interesting that God would do that. And at the same time, sometimes he would use those very same nations to be a, a hand of chastisement because of the infidelity of his people that would happen from time to time. It's fascinating when you think about it. So it says to execute on them the written judgment. So again, God said he would do that. If there are those people who would do the things that they did to with impunity to Israel, though God would allow it, they would have to pay a price for it. And then it says this honor to uh, have all of his saints so that God would be able to use his people to exact whatever it would be of the judgment and the chastisement on these uh, on these nations. So David spent a lot of time dealing with those who tried to make war against them. And uh, and so you, you can find that there were those times that they were able to do it. Um, God would give them victory over their adversaries, though at times he would use their adversaries to be the ones that he would use to bring chastisement. Really amazing. So it ends, praise the Lord. Now, Psalm 150 is really very, very simple. Once again, it's it's looking at the whole of his creation. And so it says, praise the Lord. It starts that way and ends that way. These last three have that same uh, bit in common, actually before that even, but these last three for sure uh, carry that same pattern. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his mighty firmament. So <clears throat> the sanctuary we recognize, if it's speaking of the earthly one, we recognize that. The, the firmament is that that uh, part of the creation that's just above them and, you know, that, that the things of the sky. Uh, praise him in his mighty acts, the things that he has done, the works that he has accomplished or brought about. Praise him according to his excellent greatness or the, the vastness of his majesty. That you Praise him as you recognize and take notice of his grandeur, his splendor, his majesty, his greatness. 
you know, that whatever, we run out of English words to try to capture it, but you get the point. So praise him with the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet, with the lute and with the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. So let it be demonstrative at the same time. This is, again, very... Um, expressive is a good way of putting it. And I'm in, I, I'm bringing this to mind. Our very first trip to Israel, um, if you're in the old city, there's a part of the old city, it's to the west of the Western Wall, kind of built up a bit on the hill. You have to walk upstairs to get to it. And then it opens to another old part of the city. It's over by what's known as the Jewish Quarter. And uh, if you look at a map and you look up the places that are there, there's a beautiful synagogue there known, known as the uh, uh, the Herva, uh, the ruined synagogue. And um, my wife and I, where you were able to go up and you can be up on a little walkway up above it. And it's just beautiful. You get a, a look over the little plaza that's there. It's one of my favorite places in all of Jerusalem to be. And we were up there, my wife and I, we were taking pictures because you get this beautiful panoramic view of everything. And we're looking down uh, in, in the plaza and there's all of a sudden we could hear it coming our way. There was a lot of commotion and there was singing and clapping and music and everything. And it was a bar mitzvah. It was a boy coming to age and they're they're marching him through the plaza. And all of the people who are there are just so excited. And there's the sound and the music and the joy and, and the excitement of it all. This is what's being thought of here, um, not a bar mitzvah, but the idea of making this loud rejoicing uh, sound before, before God. It wasn't a noise. It was actually quite melodic. It was beautiful to hear. But the, the excitement, the singing and the, the, the shouts that were going on and the clapping and everything, it was just such a sight. And we're just sitting there watching it go by and rejoicing with them. We didn't even know who they were, obviously. But it's that it really has an infectious way where you, you can't watch it and just kind of you know, have a straight face or anything else. You're watching it and you start to smile. You rejoice in it because it's just wonderful. This is what this call is. This is a call for all of creation, as we've seen in these other Psalms that we've looked at the same way. Let all that is there recognize who he is and sing forth praise. And then there is this, this last one. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So that's this general call to all all those who draw breath, all those who have life, let them join in this chorus of praising God. Now, as we conclude, and, and since we've concluded this, uh, this book of Psalms, once again, just to kind of recap this, think of all of what we've seen since we began this study through the Psalms. Some of the, the Psalms deal with poetry and they're beautiful and they're they're very thoughtful other ones will talk about the greatness of his creation and they really call people to consider these things you know let your mind just take in what god has created and what he has done and you know marvel at what you've seen other times we see that there are prophetic talking about future things that that the, the writer of Psalms couldn't have possibly fully grasped that we do. So I think of the one where it says that the, that the Lord said to my Lord, uh, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, well, that idea and making him a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the father speaking to the son. We know that because we have the ability to look back on it. So you have such a variety of things. So often you will find David in times of just deep distress and trouble, crying out to God, knowing that God will hear him and comfort him and give him peace. Those times when he recognizes that uh, we and all humans have this, that we, we fail so often, but he's a God who forgives. So as you go through them and as you maybe go back and reflect on them, just remember once again, the Psalms are, are very easy for us to go ahead and look at them and to recognize again that what has been written and what's put there is something that we can very easily come alongside and say, I so agree with this. I so identify with this. I join in in the rejoicing or I can make absolute perfect application to what's been said by that person. I totally agree with it. I want to repeat it. I want to put it on my refrigerator. I want to post it on my social media or whatever you do to communicate and uh, and have it be there as a reminder to you. So the Psalms, absolutely magnificent. They cover hundreds of years of their history, not all written by David, uh, but by a variety of different writers with all kinds of different intentions. So 
You know, if you go back and you do it and you read it in your devotional sense, if you ever want to go back and look at what we've uh, studied through here, if you want to go back and, and listen to that as you read through it, then by all means do it. But just recognize that this is not something, the book of Psalms was not written like the New Testament things that are written like, here's to the church, these are things you need to know, here's how you're supposed to conduct yourself, this is what what is expected, here's what we believe. This is more one of those things of a collection of people at various times in their life speaking about things that were on their heart. And sometimes God would actually give them insights to things that they weren't really seeking out, but God uses them to write about things in a prophetic sense that would only make sense when we see Jesus or or things later to, uh, to times in history when God would be speaking about things that would happen future. It's a fascinating book. Its composition is unlike any other, and it, it has some just amazing ins and outs. If you're just catching this in the last parts of the Psalms, you know, maybe you started watching these or uh, getting a, getting onto the channel maybe just months ago. Again, we've been in this book of Psalms since May of last year. So it's been a year and five months since we started this. Go back and if you want to study through the whole book of Psalms, we'll wait for you. Um, and we'll be getting into to Proverbs next, and you can just catch back up with us. So uh, it's been a joy to share this with you. Again, I, I was really surprised it's taken that long to get through this. But like with all of Scripture, there's no sense in rushing through it. We want to try to glean everything that we can out of it. He's done some miraculous things and taken such great lengths to communicate to us. So it's why we take the approach that we do to the text. And uh, we want to make sure that we get to every chapter, every verse, every book, and that we would know the full counsel of God. So we'll pick up at Proverbs next week. And uh, we are still working through the book of Revelation on Thursdays. We ask you to join us for both of those. And uh, you can always catch up with us later because we record them and we keep them on uh, YouTube. You can catch up uh, with them at, at your pace. So we will see you next week for the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm.